all this is dr mubin sayed from drbean.com welcome to one more show so the discussion today is credited to texas meg and then texas meg said that john snyder had asked her to read this this uh, paper so credit to both of them this is a very interesting study the study actually says that sars cov 2 is able to suppress our immune system especially the cytotoxic arm and that is how it escapes the immunity and this is what i'll explain now before we go in the details of the studies we'll first look at the abstract of the study or the summary of it and then we'll look at the details however what i will request you to keep in mind is look at the empirical evidence as well you know around you we all know the cases hospitalizations icus deaths and there is a proportion majority of the people do not suffer as some unfortunate minority does so it is not necessary that the mechanism that we will study today is applicable broadly to everyone with full severity meaning many of us majority of us will have sars cov 2 and survive and then in some it will become severe as well and here are the here is one of the mechanisms that helps sars cov 2 become uh be able to suppress the immune system to continue to proliferate and replicate and and cause damage so let's start So this is drbean.com there is a link in the description to drbean.com 900 videos premium just check out that link that link i think you'll be amazed how how cheap i don't like to call it cheap how inexpensive it is okay so here is the study sars-cov-2 inhibits induction of mhc class 1 pathway by targeting the stat1 irf1 nlrc5 axis and if it doesn't make sense yet it's okay <laughs> we'll go through this but generally what it means is that sars cov 2 uh, sars cov 2 can suppress immune system there are some other um, references as well that i have left in the description of this video these references would help clarify some of the terms that are there i went over the study as you can tell i would actually request you to go over the study by yourself as well it is quite a thorough piece of work and it is impossible for me to go over every single thing from this study so study discusses open reading frame 6 8 it also talks about non structural protein 1 5 13 etc i'm only going to use open reading frame 6 as the main player and assume the rest so let's start here is the basic summary the summary is that here is a cell let's say this is lung epithelial cell the surface cells of the lungs these are filled with let's say sars cov 2 these cells need help these cells need cytotoxic t cells our immune system cells to come and kill them because they they are filled with the virus and viruses are using these cells as a factories to make more viruses and here is let's say a cytotoxic t cell standing next to this sick cell and this cell is saying all is good no issues and this cell the sick cell is saying help i need help what is the reason the reason is that the cytotoxic t cell only provides help if it can do a handshake with the sick cell that is a must the two cells have to connect with each other through arms and we'll discuss them only then they can interact however here the sars cov 2 has made this cell the sick cell unable to extend an arm and this arm let's call it mhc1 
And because of that, this cell is not shaking the hand of the cytotoxic T cell. So cytotoxic T cell is not going to engage and not going to help. This is what study found. The question in our mind should be, how did this happen? And that's what we'll see. So these are our gifts for humanity. They are continuing. This is a study. I just showed it to you. Abstract of the study is the following. Now I'm going to show you the complete picture without the disability of the arm. So let's start from the left side. Here is a cell. Let's say this is the lung epithelial cell or the airway surface cell. This cell is infected by SARS-CoV-2 or other viruses. Or this cell may have a cancer in it. The, this mechanism that I'm going to describe is the same in all these cases. What is these cases in general, if you wanted to categorize it? A cell that is sick, a cell that has something wrong in it, either viruses, bacteria, fungi, or cancerous machinery. In all those cases, the cell will reach out to the immune system to say, please kill me. I cannot continue. And how does it do that? Every nucleated cell, every nucleated cell has a protein in it is called MHC1, Major Histocompatibility Complex 1, MHC1. MHC1 protein, here I've drawn it in black, it is loaded with the pieces of antigen. Antigen meaning the foreign substance, foreign actor, or even in the case of a cancer cell, the incorrect developmental proteins within the cell. This antigen here in the red, it is loaded on the MHC1. Imagine if I am that cell and my hand is MHC1 and I load it with a piece of the virus and I show it to you. Now just seeing it is not enough. You do a handshake with me, you feel this little protein in my hand and then you react. This is how it works. So my hand here is called MHC1, Major Histocompatibility Complex 1. So the most important thing to keep in mind now for this whole study, if a cell is not able to produce MHC1, if a cell is not able to produce MHC1, then it can never activate the immune system to help it. That's the basic concept to keep in mind. Okay, so the cell has MHC1 outside. It is loaded with the antigen. This phenomena is called antigen presentation. So we'll say the cell is presenting the antigen. Here is a cytotoxic T cell. This cytotoxic T cell, if you see, here has its own arm, which is called T cell receptor or TCR. That arm binds with the antigen as well. And then this cytotoxic T cell also has one more arm, which is called MHC8. This is like you may have seen sometimes in movies that when people do a handshake, they do not do a handshake just with one hand. They do a handshake with one hand and then they bring the other hand on top of it as well. And they kind of do a more strong, robust handshake. This is the same thing over here. There is an other arm that comes over from the cytotoxic T cell and binds to MHC1, and that is called co-stimulation. Our body has protection mechanisms so that our cells are not accidentally killed by the immune system. Even then, the whole mechanism fails every once in a while. There is actually going to be some chemical substances that will be released from each cell to the other to activate. So there are lots of double checking mechanisms before this cytotoxic T cell becomes active. And if I go back to this picture for a second, I have done this discussion previously many times that a cytotoxic T cell has something that is called a perforin. 
and something that is called a granzyme. These are proteins in it. Perforin, as the name suggests, make perforations, holes. So cytotoxic T cell, once becoming active, will actually release a protein that would create a puncture in the nearby cell with which it is doing a handshake. This is like somebody doing a handshake with two arms and then has a third arm with which it stabs the other person it is doing a handshake with. And once it creates a hole in the target cell using perforin, then it throws proteins inside like grenades. And these proteins are called granzymes, very similar to the word grenade. These granzymes, when they go in the target cell, they go and activate something called caspases. I call caspases the Casper the ghost. So these caspases would then in turn activate another protein called ubiquitin, which would then result in cell to die. So caspases, Casper the ghost, they would make the cell a ghost or they'll kill it. This is a normal action. So back here, SARS-CoV-2 can reduce the presentation of MHC-1, according to the study, by 66%. That is a huge down-regulation of the presentation of the immune system. This, I'll give you one more example, and then we'll go into the detail. You may have seen movies where there is a thief or a robber or a criminal or a person who escaped a jail, they come in to a home and police is chasing them and they go in the home and they, they hide themselves in the home and they tell the family who's living there that don't you talk at all, don't you speak at all, and even if the cop is outside on the door, just tell them everything is fine. This is what the virus does. When it's inside the cell, it makes the cell not able to produce MHC1 and not able to present the viral pieces outside, that way the immune system doesn't even know something wrong is happening. It allows that virus to continue to replicate in this cell, continue to use that cell as a machinery, as a factory, and keep making more daughters. That's it. This is the discussion. This is how SARS-CoV-2 escapes immunity by down-regulating the, the infected cell's interaction with the immune cell. And that down-regulation regu is done through reducing MHC1 protein on the surface of nucleated cells. Good? Okay, so now I'm going to go into the mechanisms of this. It still will not dig into every single part of the study. It is a, such a beautiful and thorough study. But imagine an abstract of the whole mechanism. So if you just wanted to hear this much, you're good. You can go. Otherwise, let's go in the details. So let's learn. First concept, I'm going to go. This study is very delicate that we have to actually understand the delicate points one by one to then put them all together. Otherwise, it becomes a mush. So here, concept number one. Here is an innate arm cell, let's say dendritic cell or a macrophage. When a pathogen arrives from outside, for example, a virus, a bacteria, a fungus, the innate arm cells get the first chance of picking it up phagocytosing it, that is eating it up, breaking it down into smaller pieces, and then presenting it on their surface. This presentation, innate arm, this presentation is done using an arm or a protein which is called MHC2, not one, we discussed one a second ago, two. The cells that can present an antigen on MHC2 these cells are called professional antigen-presenting cells. They are the cops of the system. Macrophages, dendritic cells, and B cells. B cells are part of acquired arm of the immune system. Macrophages and dendritic cells are part of innate arm. So what is the takeaway here? The takeaway is this. Innate arm gets the first chance of picking up the pathogen, destroying it, and then expressing the the pieces of it, 
on its surface, on the surface of the cell using MHC2. This MHC2 here, I'm making it blue, is presenting a little piece of the virus on it. And MHC2 then binds with a tiny little cute cell that is called T helper zero cells or naive T cells. Naive T cell is called naive T cell because it is yet not aware of what will it do in its life. It is just a raw cell, it is naive cell. Once the naive T cell binds with the innate arm cell, let's use dendritic cell, then it depends what kind of chemical substances are present in the vicinity of this naive T cell. If the chemical substance present is interleukin 12, if the environment is showered or filled with interleukin 12, then this T helper naive cell says, oh, I know my purpose in life is to become T helper 1 cell. If there was in the environment interleukin 4, then the T cell helper cell would say, oh, I know my purpose in life is to become T helper 2 cell. So here we are talking about interleukin 12. If you thought, where does interleukin 12 come from? It usually comes from the antigen presenting cell as well. Good. So professional antigen presenting cell, the innate arm presented the antigen to the T naive T cell. Naive T cell in the presence of interleukin 12 became T helper 1. T helper 1 in turn re releases interleukin 2, that is 1, and secondly, it releases interferon gamma. This is very important. Normally in the immune system, we say interferon gamma and interleukin 12 axis is very important. What does that mean? The, the cell, innate arm cell, is producing interleukin 12. In return, the T helper one cell produces inter interferon gamma. Interferon gamma can activate the immune system. That is one. And hear this out. This is really, really important and delicate point. Interferon gamma is responsible to help the cells produce more MHC1 and more MHC2. This is it. This is a very important point to keep in mind. Interferon gamma is responsible to allow a normal sick cell to produce more MHC1 so that it can present more antigen to outside and it could request help from the immune system by handshaking with them. What does this mean? If I am a normal sick cell, and if you pour interferon gamma on me, I will grow two arm and three arm and four and five and 10 and 20. I'll grow 100 arms. And on each arm, I'll have a piece of the virus loaded on it. And I would not miss a chance to activate the immune system. So that means the concept here is it is important for the interferon gamma to be present in the system so that cells can present antigen to immune system. So that also means, what do you think if we were a virus or a bacteria or other, but mostly viruses, if we were a virus, what will we try to do? We'll think that, oh man, this cell is going to produce interferon gamma. Interferon gamma is going to help cells make more MHC1, our pieces will be presented outside, will be killed very fast with the cell. So why not we figure out a way to reduce the production of interferon gamma? That is the study. The study showed that SARS-CoV-2 disables the response to interferon gamma, not just production of the interferon gamma, but this normal cell's response to interferon gamma. And the response to interferon gamma is what? make more MHC1. So when the response cannot work, then more MHC1 is not there. That means cell cannot really interact with the immune system. So here, if you see, interferon gamma is produced. That allowed this normal sick cell to produce more MHC1, which allowed that to 
interact with cytotoxic T cell. On the other hand, the same naive T cell, sorry, T helper one cell is also releasing interleukin two, which is activating the T cells. So it has activated this whole system and allowed these two cells to interact with each other. Finally, this cell is going to kill the other cell. I'm sure that you're thinking, we don't want the other cells to be killed. If we don't get the other cells killed, and they may be important cells, they may be lung cells, they may be liver cells, they may be muscle cells. Yes, they are important cell. But if they're not killed, if they're cancer, then the cancer would spread and we will not even be able to spend a single day on this earth without having a cancer of some sort. Or these virus, any viral infection, the very first viral infection in us will kill us if this was not happening. So the first concept done, right? Concept is interferon gamma allows the sick cells or cancerous cells to produce more MHC1. Next concept. This concept is how do we make proteins? So the idea of transcription and translation, and this is also used in this study, so it is very important. And I'm going to use still the context of the study. So imagine this is a cell. On this cell's surface are receptors of hundreds of kinds of receptors. One type of receptor is called JAK-STAT based interferon gamma receptor. So here, let's say the neighboring cell produced interferon gamma. Interferon gamma connected with this cell's receptor, which has a JAK-STAT pathway. It is just internal uh, proteins. So once the JAK becomes connected with the interferon gamma, inside the JAK does what? It phosphorylates STAT. STAT is another protein. Phosphorylation means what? It attaches a phosphate to it. Our immune system is such a strange thing. It uses money to work. The whole cells use money to work. The money is ATP and phosphate is the currency in the system. So anytime something is asked to function, that thing says, give me money or I will not function. So imagine if you ask me to do, you know what, Mubin, teach us a lecture. And I say, fine, give me phosphates and then I'll do the lecture. That is what happens here. Every single protein that needs to be activated normally would like to have phosphates. And that process of giving phosphate or attaching a phosphate to a protein is called phosphorylation. So here, once interferon gamma is connected on the surface, inside the cell, the STAT pathway becomes active, JAK, genus kinase, and STAT pathway. STAT proteins become phosphorylated. Then they go in the nucleus. This is called translocation. You would come across this word a lot in this study as well. Translocation from cytoplasm to the nucleus, meaning this protein will enter the nucleus. Once it is inside the nucleus, it will work with some gene and produce some messenger RNA. Now, here is another important point to keep in mind. When there is gamma, interferon gamma, knocking on the door outside or stimulating this cell, then the gene that will become expressed due to this pathway. That gene is called gamma-associated gene. So these are gas genes, gamma-associated something genes. So gas gene is activated by stats. The result of that is what? Every time a gene is expressed, is opened up by something like this that you're seeing, then the gene will take that DNA piece that gene is made up of, and we will make a copy from it. This is done by RNA polymerases, but just generally, we'll take that gene in the DNA, we'll make a copy of that gene. That copy is called messenger RNA. That messenger RNA will exit the nucleus and come out in the cytoplasm. This messenger RNA will then go to the chef in the cell, which is called a ribosome. I've made the ribosome over here as a lonely little thing, but they are actually connected with endoplasmic reticulum. And what they do is they take this messenger RNA, 
they read this recipe, they generate a protein, and they inject that protein in the lumen. Lumen means the cavity of the endoplasmic reticulum. You can think of this as if there is a chef standing in the kitchen, they're cooking something in a pot, that pot being the endoplasmic reticulum and the chef being this, the ribosome. So protein is formed. Some proteins that are formed will actually exit the cell and go and function on the other things. For example, interferon gamma itself was produced by T helper one cell and exited that cell and came into uh, near the cell and not into, but on the surface of this cell and worked there. So some proteins get out. Some proteins stay within the cytoplasm of the cell and do some function. Some proteins go back in the nucleus and do some function in the nucleus. Today we are talking about the proteins that will go back in the nucleus and function there. So translocation would occur. So if I can repeat this process, there was a messenger outside or a something that would stimulate a, recep a receptor. And there was a second messenger system called JAK-STAT pathway that caused STAT activation through phosphorylation. STAT went into the nucleus, opened up the DNA, a messenger RNA was produced. Messenger RNA is nothing but the copy of that gene that came out and according to that copy, ribosomes made a protein. This protein, in case of this discussion that we are doing today, interferon gamma, the proteins that are made are IRF1 and NL, NLRC5. These are the two proteins of our interest. There are other as well. For example, inositol triphosphate system is activated as well, or IP3 system is activated too. Inositol phosphate system is activated too. For example, nuclear factor K beta system is activated too. We're not talking about any of those. We're just talking about these two interesting proteins that researchers looked at. So IRF1 and NLRC5, these two proteins are now going to try to go into the nucleus. They would like to translocate. So I hope the second concept is clear as well. First concept was that we will produce interferon gamma as a result of the activity of the pathogen. Interferon gamma would want a normal cell to produce many proteins, but one of the pro two proteins that are important are inter IRF1 and NLRC5. Good, interferon gamma and this. Third concept. These two little proteins, IRF1 and NLR, NLRC5, they will get loaded on cargo proteins. And many of you who have been with me for two and a half years might remember, I talked about a drug, I will not name it. I talked about a drug two years ago. And the function of that drug was to destroy or disrupt the viral cargo from going into the cell. If you know the name, you can <laughs> type it in the comments. So here, IRF1 and NLRC5 that are produced in the cell in response to interferon gamma, they will get loaded on a cargo protein system. This is called Karyophrin, <laughs> very creative name. Just like we are cool beans without C, but K, cool beans. Here, this is a karyoprotein, carrier protein. We call it karyophrin with K. This little karyophrin protein will pick up these two guys independently. There'll be multiple complexes. And they would pass through the nuclear pore. Nuclear pore is a hole or multiple holes in the nucleus wall or membrane through which proteins can go back in. I did a study a few months ago where I talked about a protein that will get in uh, in context of the spike protein and it will translocate or co-locate inside the nucleus. And some people 
challenged me. It, sometimes it is interesting that people will not read the study, but they would just challenge me and I have to then continue to explain from the study. They challenged me that how can this protein be inside the nucleus? Please remember when a cell is dividing. So that's not the case with this cell, but immune cells, for example. When they are dividing, they tear down the nucleus membrane, nuclear membrane, because they have to duplicate the nuclear material. So when they tear down the nuclear membrane, duplicate the nuclear material, then they make the nuclear membrane again for two daughter cells. While the nuclear membranes are being constructed, it is a possibility at that time to, for many cytoplasmic proteins to spill in through the broken or half-built walls in the nucleus. So here, that is not the case. Karyophorines will go in the nucleus through legitimate routes, and these are little holes through which they would carry their cargo and go into the nucleus. Good. So three steps now. Interferon gamma released by the immune system attached on the surface of a normal sick cell. It actually attaches to every cell surface, but sick cell would do this. Attached to the surface of a cell, sick cell, sick cell in return produced IRF1 and NLRC5. And these two proteins got loaded on karyophorine. Karyophorine went into the nucleus. And this would happen to all cells. Sick cell can take advantage of it. Okay, continuing. Next concept. Now let's see this part one by one. Let's start from here. When the interferon gamma is activating a cell, there are multiple proteins that are made. I talked about IRF1, correct? I talked about NLRC5. Now they're going back in the nucleus, sitting on a cargo vehicle. When they go back, they then attach to various genes to help promote them. Inside the genes, imagine every single gene is a chapter in a book. And standing next to the genes are little platforms on which gene expression proteins can come and stand there and they can help express the gene. So such places are called promoters. Promoters promote genes. Imagine you are in a festival and there are various promoters for various kind of things that are happening there. So this IRF1 will come in. Remember, its gene got expressed and it, it the mRNA went out and the IRF1 was produced. It has now come back in the nucleus. Once it has come back in the nucleus, it will come and act on a gene as a promoter. That gene is going to make MHC1 protein or help make MHC1 protein. This is one stimulator. We'll call it co-stimulator. Why? Because MHC1 gene expression needs NLRC5 and IRF1 needs more than one promoters to come and stimulate it. A beautiful mechanism. I, I love how our body is made. Okay, so the IRF1 comes back, attaches to something called ISRE part of the gene for MIC1. IRSR, ISRE stands for Interferon Stimulated Response Element. It comes and binds here in, on the DNA. We also know that NLRC5 has arrived inside as well. NLRC5 binds with some more proteins as well, and that whole machinery, that complex, also binds with another set of promoter area or region. So once both of them are connected, then this MHC gene is able to become expressed. And its copy will be formed, messenger RNA will be formed, that messenger RNA will get out. And as I discussed before as well, when messenger RNA goes in the cytoplasm, there are ribosomes there that will pick it up and these will make protein. What protein are they going to make? MHC1. That's what we wanted. 
So in response to a message from interferon gamma on the surface of the cell, the cell has started manufacturing more MHC1s. And you saw the whole pathway in the middle. This pathway is called interferon STAT1, IRF1, NLRC5 pathway or axis. Right? Interferon outside, STAT1, second step, production of the uh, IRF1 and production of NLRC5, third step, both of them going back in the nucleus, fourth step, stimulating the gene or promoting the gene for making MSC1, fifth step, then MSC1 messenger RNA formed, sixth mRNA comes out in the, in the cytoplasm, attaches with the ribosome, makes MSC1, seventh or eighth step. That MSC1 would now load the pathogen pieces and express them outside and this cell would be killed by the immune system. Okay, so now we know all the normal behavior. What does a SARS-CoV-2 do to defeat this? Right, so it's a virus, doesn't think, they're just, it has a selection pressure, so it has to figure out how do I defeat this whole mechanism. Here is what it does. First, in this virus, when the SARS-CoV-2 is being produced, we have many uh, genes of the SARS-CoV-2 itself getting expressed. And the most important gene for this study, open reading frame 6 gene proteins, ORF6. When the ORF6 of the virus is produced, overexpressed in a cell, meaning cell is now hijacked, by the virus. Virus is making its own type of things in it. Let's imagine virus is an alien and it is making its own alien parts. One of the parts is ORF6, 7, 8, then uh, non-structural proteins, NSPs 1, 5, 3, 8, whatever, spike proteins, right? So ORF6 of the virus, when it is present in large amounts, what it does is Number one, this stat, remember stat, Jack and then stat? <laughs> That's like Jack and Jill, Jill. Stat, phosphorylation occurs. That means we give money to the stat. The, the cell says, I have interferon gamma knocking at my door saying, hey, get ready, make more MSC1s. There is a virus in here. So I should activate stat system. I should phosphorylate it. So phosphorylation of STAT occurs, but STAT is not allowed to go back in the nucleus. ORF6 blocks that. So the first damage or first disruption that the virus does is it would not let STAT1 to go in the nucleus. All of a sudden, I think you can think if STAT1 cannot get in the nucleus, how will it cause the promotion of IRF1 and NLRCF, C5. So already you can think that those things would now be suppressed. So this is the first action. The disruption of this axis is happening right in front of your eyes. Then second, IRF1 and NLRC5 expression is suppressed. Interestingly, this virus, if I go back here for a second, not only blocks or disrupts the expression of IRF1, meaning production of IRF1, it will then disrupt their function too. This is like, I'm going to use a gross term here, but you would then remember it. This is like something that is blocking the production of babies. And if the babies are made, then it is blocking the function of babies or letting the babies become humans and doing things. So same thing over here. These are not babies, these are proteins. So this virus, ORF6, is going to block the production of IRF1 and NLRC5. And if some are produced, it's going to block their functioning as well. What a clever little thing. So if you see here, this is number two. Expression of IRF1 and NLRC5 is disrupted. 
that means now we have less messenger RNA. Even then, we have some messenger RNA that would get out and the IRF1 protein and NLRC5 protein will be formed. These will then be loaded on karyophorines. Next attack, next disruption. Presence of, of overexpression of ORF6 disrupts the karyophorines. That little cargo vehicle is also disrupted by the virus. So who's going to bring the IRF1 and NLRC5 in the nucleus? The cargoes, the cargo vehicles are damaged. Not really damaged. What happens is the ORF6 expression and ORF8 as well, they do not let the protein that wants to go in and use this cargo vehicle. It does not let these two things connect with each other. We had one clever drug that did a similar action but towards the virus. That drug disrupted the viral cargo from binding with the cargo vehicles to go in, the, in our nucleus. Here we are seeing the viruses attack on us. So the virus ORF6 and 8 is blocking the IRF1 and NLRC5 to become bound to karyophorine. So no binding, no translocation in the nucleus. One expression is reduced, second translocation in the nucleus is reduced. When the translocation in the nucleus is reduced, that means for MHC1 production, the gene expression is reduced. By one, there are less of these two proteins. Two, even if there are some, they're not able to get in this nucleus to do the gene expression. Done. Result, 66% reduction in production of MHC1. Another interesting thing is that carboxy terminus is needed of the, the uh, viruses ORF6. What does that mean? When we have proteins, Proteins normally have an N-terminal, then amino acids. Every amino acid has an N-terminal and a carboxy terminal, or an N or C. And then you chain them together like this. So eventually, even for the big peptide or the protein, one side is nitrogenous and one side is carboxy. And they are saying that if you trim the viruses, ORF6, ORF6 protein, if you trim its carboxy end, then it doesn't work correctly. So somehow that end is necessary to be present, although the researchers say we were unable to tell how does it function. But we just knew the result of it that if you damage the carboxy terminal, then it does not function. What does that mean? Why do they bring it up? Maybe there can be therapeutics, antivirals that can be created, whose job is to attack the carboxy terminal of ORF6. And all of a sudden, this whole action of the virus to suppress and escape the immune system will be poof, gone. That is their conclusion to say that with our research, we hope that drugs that can be targeted to protect this pathway can be made. So this is the discussion. Thank you very much um, for being here, for listening in. Parth is here. Parth, you should know this. these things. You're a medical student in third year, I believe. I'm sure that you know all of this from your second year. If not, I need to talk with you for why not. So here we are. Please like, subscribe, and share. Um, there are links in the description. There is a link to buy access to Dr. Bean. These discussions of immune system and how does it work, I've done them and these premium content are present on Dr. Bean. So there is a link in the description. It's a one-time fee. Take advantage of that. So that's one. You can also buy me a coffee, <laughs> just a phosphorylation of Dr. Bean. You can buy me a coffee. You can become a member of Substack. You can become a patron. You can buy YouTube membership as well. And you can start on Locals too. So with this, thank you very much. If you just wanted to do the smallest thing, easiest thing, then you can like. You slight more, di <laughs> more difficult is subscribe and share. And then there are links. 
Thank you very much. Stay safe and happy and healthy. I would see you tomorrow. Bye-bye for now.